All right, so what I'm going to try to do is go off what Maiko did on, like, the class a few weeks ago. So she kind of introduced, like, the upper quarter and did a really fast overview of this is everything that you should do during the test. Um, what I'm going to try to do is simplify it a little bit into something that you can actually use in, like, your everyday treatments and diagnoses. So hopefully it'll be a little bit more clear um, and a little bit more, like, applicable to, like, a specific patient, no matter who comes in the door. Um, so it says upper quarter, but I'm really focusing on the shoulder and kind of like the humerus. So you'll see that a little bit later, but mostly just the shoulder and not so much the neck for this presentation. Um, so just so we're clear before I start, because I get a lot of questions on, are you diagnosing what you like? what you see or what they can't do. So just to be clear, um, with the MSI system, we, see, we name it how we see it. So if you see internal rotation of the scapula, it's called scapular internal rotation. Short, short and simple. Um, so it's what you see in most tests. I'll have a lot of pictures that are obviously just like clips of an alignment, but kind of you, use your imagination in that they would do that same fault through all of their tests. Um, so if you see it in one test and never see this impairment in any other test, it's likely not their main problem. Um, it's also what causes pain, and then going along with the second or the last bullet is that it's alleviated with a secondary test. So if they're in internal rotation when they're standing and they're in pain, and then you put them into a little external rotation and that alleviated their symptoms, that would be their diagnosis. And then the last bullet point is just a study that I found that the scapular assistance test that's like um, going into shoulder flexion, if you manually help them, um, go into more upward rotation of the scapula. Um, that is shown to be reliable in like the second, that is a good secondary test to perform. Um, so then that kind of just solidifies your diagnosis as what you thought it would be. So um, keeping this in mind, we're going to, it's going to be nice and interactive, so no sleeping. These are our diagnosis. So this is your word bank that you get to choose from for the next like 10 slides. So um, scapular internal, I kind of did from what I see the most, starting on the top left, to what I see the least on the bottom right. So scapular internal rotation is uh, by far the most popular diagnosis that most patients I've seen in my short career um, have had. But um, scapular elevation is not as likely. So um, keep these diagnoses. They should look familiar to the same one that Michael talked about. Um, um, keep these words in your mind as we go through these next few slides. So with these pictures, these patients both have the same scapular diagnosis. I'll give you some cues. I heard it all together at some point. So this person has scapular internal rotation with insufficient upward rotation. So what you're looking at is why this line, I don't know if this little point will work. Oh, yeah, right here. Um, if you can see the medial border of the scapula right here, it's likely internally rotated. You shouldn't be able to see someone's medial border like that. And then this angle over here, this should be at 60 degrees. So this corner is kind of drawn on her, but the corner... Her inferior angle should be more like up here. So that's how you get the diagnosis of internal rotation with insufficient upward rotation. Yeah? No, it is not. And I have a good slide later on that will be scapular winging. Um, in some people's definition, they say that internal rotation is winging. But in our book, winging is the like an injury to the long thoracic nerve. So then that will be m much more significant. And we have a really good picture later of someone that has technical winging. These people don't have nerve injury. It's more just muscle melts. And you'll likely see this, like I said, in multiple, um, multiple different uh, tests. So shoulder flexion, shoulder abduction, stuff like that. So there's your di uh, diagnosis, internal rotation with insufficient upward. Again, these patients have the same diagnosis, kind of obviously on the left side pointing to the, her right shoulder. Yeah, so this would be scapular depression. Um, the three ways to determine scapular depression is the 
angle of the upper trapezius. So there's no real like, it should be a certain degree. But as you can see on the girl on, the, uh, on your left, it's significantly increased. So it'd be significantly depressed on that side. And then on the, when you're looking from the front, the horizontal clavicles. So your clavicle should slightly upwardly slope. But because his are, he is in the depressed position of his scapula, his, his clavicles are more horizontal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, and if they come in with shoulder pain, then you're likely thinking that it's the shoulder that's causing the issue, but that's not always true. So I definitely, and that's why in the alignment, um, always go through the spine first, clear that out before going to the tests even. Okay. This one's a little trickier. If that helps. It's kind of bilateral. I would say it might even be worse on her right shoulder. So to be uh, normal, you should be within th or three inches from the spine. So that's kind of where I do like this, or Maiko did like her hand. Um, so this would be scapular adduction. So an external rotation goes with adduction. So internal rotation would go with abduction, and external rotation would go, would go with adduction. So these are the people that do too many rows that have two, two, their rhomboids, their middle traps are too strong, pulling them in too close to their spine. And this will be very apparent on our standing test where you're standing and you do just lateral rotation because their rhomboids will turn on immediately. Okay. This one is tricky because you can only see it from behind. But again, the girl on the left is performing the bilateral shoulder flexion, which um, would be more obvious for this impairment. I can give a cue. <laughs> Looking only at the, the scapula. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's hard to see, um, and I think it's better on the guy than the lady on the left. Um, but obviously, if you can see the medial border, your first thought is internal rotation. Um, and then these are technically internal rotation with an anterior tilt. Like I said, it's hard to see from behind. But that's why I circled his, like, inferior angle down here it sticking out, meaning that he's um, tilted forward. I would also agree that this lady is insufficient upward. She should be a lot more rotated at this point of shoulder flexion. <laughs> Does that kind of make sense? Okay. That dot is just to cover up a tattoo. It's not anything. <laughs> this guy, uh, this guy over here, he was a wrestler, a wrestling coach. If that gives you any uh, clues about his what his diagnosis might be. <laughs> yes, yes, I heard it somewhere. Internal rotation with abduction. Um, so that again is the three inches thing, three inches from the spine. And you see this in a lot of wrestlers, like uh, kayakers, people that do this motion a lot. Um, and it's also a very common diagnosis that I see with abduction. It's also all of those like um, axioscapular muscles are very weak. So middle traps, lower traps, rhomboids, those type of things. And then this coming up one is hopefully pretty obvious. It's his left shoulder. Yes. Um, 
and it's a very uncommon diagnosis. This guy had cervical pain, if that's helpful. Elevation, yeah, scapular elevation would be, and this is not supposed to make an angle, it's just that that's where the lines ended up. The first, the bottom one is showing the horizontal clavicle, and the top one is showing the um, angle of his upper trap. So like I said earlier, there's not really a specific degree, but you can tell that his is not a good slope of the upper trap. The third thing to determine this, which you can't see because it would be from behind, is um, that the root of the spine of the scapula should be at the level of T3. And for some people, I know it's more difficult to palpate on than others. Um, that's why I like these two um, more to determine the elevation or depression. But like I said, this is not likely um, going to be your main diagnosis because someone that's coming in with cervical pain is probably going to get a cervical diagnosis of extension flexion rotation rather than a scapular diagnosis. And some people are confused, like, what if they have neck pain, but then they have this, this scapula. You can give them both a cervical and a scapular diagnosis, but your first diagnosis would be what their main pain is. So this guy, let's just assume that he has cervical extension. Your di first diagnosis would be cervical extension. Your second would be scapular elevation. So your main focus of your treatment would be on the neck, and then you can also kind of go together with the shoulder. This, the guy on the left should be pretty obvious for this one. His right shoulder. Yeah. yeah. Depression is obviously on his right shoulder. And these two diagnoses don't necessarily go together because like earlier I showed internal rotation with insufficient upward, but not everyone follows the book. You can tell that. So he can also have a scapular depression with you just notice that he has insufficient upward. You can't really tell that from this picture. You just know that he's in a lot of downward rotation, which makes me assume that when he would do a shoulder flexion test, he wouldn't upwardly rotate enough. Obviously, you can't tell that from the picture. but And then the girl on the right, whenever you do full end range shoulder flexion, should get into the in line with C6, C7. And she's obviously kind of holding down lower. She should get much higher than that, which is how you could determine that. And this is a good quadruped is one of my favorite positions to determine if you're like still kind of on the fence um, because they're weight bearing through their arms. So you can see all the muscle imbalances that you may not see whenever they're just standing. Any thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this these people, I think they're two different people, actually. Um, Internal rotation with anterior tilt. This might be a little bit of abduction also, um, but again, it's what you see most in, most commonly in all the tests and what's causing their pain. So if you put him in a posterior tilt, does that take away his pain? Then more likely you'll go with anterior tilt. And last one, hopefully this answers your question from earlier. <laughs> this, I don't think we need the arrows, but this is scapular winging. So this would be a injury to the long thoracic nerve that controls the serratus anterior. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is what we would diagnose as scapular winging compared to internal rotation, which is going to be a lot more subtle. Hopefully you can tell that. I think it's because he's incredibly strong in every other muscle that's not innervated by the long thoracic. With probably low trap and stuff. Yeah, and his delts are really strong. You can see that from here. Yeah. But he just doesn't have the serratus. Not at all. No. 
I'm sure I was told at one some point, but I don't remember. Patients that were seen in the clinic in, Saint, in our clinic at WashU, though. So. Okay, so those are the main humoral diagnoses, or scapular diagnoses. These are, this is your word bank. I'll give you a hint. We're only going to see these over here for the next few slides. Um, but they're also the more common. I did the same thing. So humoral anterior glide, we see like every single day. It's very common. Um, and then the other two on the far, uh, on my side over here, are more kind of generalized. They don't really s display any of the other ones, but they are just excessively mobile or ex excessively not immobile. Um, so that's what these two over here are. But our main focus for um, our treatment that I'm going to talk about later is going to be humoral anterior glide because that's kind of what's most common. Kind of give it away here. Yeah, so this would be humoral anterior glide. Hopefully it's obvious. And as you can tell with the two on that side, it's very obvious in this position. So if you're going to do a standing lateral rotation test, it's... Um, the subscap is going to be challenged in that position, so um, you'll see a lot of the anterior glide. And just alignment, like Michael probably explained, the acromion, the um, edge of the humerus, should not be more than one-third in front of the, the acromion if you're looking from the lateral side. So that's kind of what this is showing. That's also anterior glide in a different position. So that's more of an anterior inferior glide of the humerus and full end range shoulder flexion. A lot of people that are very hypermobile, you'll see in that position because um, that's going to be what they say causes their pain. A lot of people with anterior shoulder pain also have humeral anterior glide. Basically, the big generalized picture is that they're Subscap is weak. There's something that's not holding their humeral head into their the socket of the glenoid. Can also say that the posterior capsule, things in the back, um, lateral rotators are nice and stiff, pushing it forward, pushing it anterior, not allowing it again to sit back in the glenoid. This is very common in swimmers, volleyball players, people that do a lot of overhead motion um, with their pitchers, I guess, with their arm kind of behind them like this. Um, and it's people that have to be excessively mobile in certain positions, so especially swimmers, if they need to be mobile, they often give here first rather than in their scapular humerals or things in the back. Yes. That was quick. <laughs> this is humeral superior glide. We don't see this very often, um, but it's quite obvious in this guy and that is some of the things I check if someone has like an impingement syndrome if they are impinging right there and they have a humerus that's riding too high that could just make their symptoms even worse and especially some people just compensate by doing this motion but is it a shoulder shrug of their whole scapula or is it just the humerus gliding too high into the acromion so that's kind of a tricky um, diagnosis to make Basically, the rotator cuff, the things that are, should be holding it nice and stable or not strong, similar to the anterior glide. This is a diagnosis that you probably wouldn't make on its own, so it goes with other things. So they could have scapular internal rotation with humeral Anterior, anteriorly tilted. Oh, the anterior uh, humeral glide. Um, so these two, you're obviously looking at the olecranon on the girl on the right, and then the antecubital fossa on the guy on the left. So you can obviously tell this, and a lot of people when they're walking do that, um, and they don't even know it. Um, it is important with this diagnosis, though, that you're making sure that it's glenohumeral medial rotation and not scapular. 
So you have to, so like this lady, you would come in from both sides, trying not to disturb the humerus at all, and put her scapula in a better position. So if she's anteriorly tilted and internally rotated, that could make her arm look like it's in medial rotation, but it's not really. It's just the position of the scapula. So reposition the scapula and then look. If they're still in medial rotation, then it's a glenohumeral diagnosis. So it's kind of tricky, but likely this will go with other scapular diagnoses. Yeah, so your all your medial rotators are that are going to attach to your humerus are too stiff and your lateral rotators are too weak. So like your lats, your teres major, your subscap, those things are pulling too much while your infrasupra teres minor are not pulling back enough. Okay, so those were the um, diagnoses kind of one by one going through. And this guy is a good case for what happens when you see everything. So this is this is more like a patient you would see, and they, you see all of the above. And it's kind of subtle, but you see the medial border a little bit. You definitely see the inferior angle. He's pretty downwardly rotated, and probably when he shoulder flexes, he's not going to get all the way up, and more than three inches away from the spine. So... And I put these muscle impairments down at the bottom so you can kind of see what's causing all of this. So the stiff and short pec minor is obviously going to cause your anterior tilt. Um, same with pec major, infraspinatus, and all of those things. If you think about what they're presenting as and what causes that action, that's what's probably going to be stiff and short. The things that aren't working are the long and weak things. So in this guy, it's... Mostly middle trap, low trap, serratus. And those are the three things that if you see any patient that has internal rotation, which you're most likely going to see, you focus on those. And so these two, these articles up here are um, articles that we, a couple of those are um, from Wash U, but most of them are not. So this isn't just like something that we do only because we're MSI at Wash U. Um, is these are motions of the scapula that should be happening. And when they're not happening, they're likely going to be causing you pain. So you ask, why do we do so much wall slides? Why do we do so many mid-trap strengthening, all of that stuff? Just a refresher for everyone. Um, just because I came straight out of anatomy and this stuff is kind of on my brain. But um, these are the three muscles that we focus on and the three that are most used during the wall slide um, in certain exercises, why we are strengthening them. We're strengthening them because they do these actions. Most things that you're missing or most things that are causing pain um, is what we want to focus on. So if someone has internal rotation, we need it to externally rotate. If someone has... Um, posterior tilt or an anterior tilt, we need them to posteriorly tilt. Um, they're not getting enough upward rotation. We need to increase that by using these three muscles. I could read it all, but you guys can read there. So, why do we focus on wall slides? When someone asks me, how do I, what do I do to strengthen this muscle? I'm probably going to say wall slide. That's because I know that it works and I can target different uh, muscles dependent on how I position the patient. So that's kind of what we're going to get into next. So thinking about that guy that we just talked about that has all of the issues, how can we kind of focus on one specific muscle or one specific um, impairment that we see? So this is a study that was done uh, with some of my professors at WashU and some outside professors that looked at the comparison between wall slides. So that's our like forward facing um, shoulder flexion wall slide compared to um, scapular plane elevation. So just like this, including, um, not including weight, I think they were just like um, kind of abducting their arms. And then um, the push up plus, but it was only the push-up position of the push-up plus on the wall. So that's kind of just pushing into the wall, not the pushing back part. Um, in these graphs, you can kind of see, um, let's see, the top is the degree of elevation of their arms. So um, the focus was looking at 
the serratus, which you can see is here. This is the wall slide here. So this is the activation of the serratus. They put lats on here just so you can see how quiet the lat is in all of these in all of these exercises. A lot of times we see the lats are too like working too hard. And we want them to relax. So none of these um, exercises are going to be or should be if they're done correctly overusing the lats. Um, the third here, the UT is the upper trap, and then lower trap here. So as you can see, the lower trap is best in the scapular plane elevation. So the wall slide is not the best work of the lower trap, which some people might get confused on. That's why a wall slide is not the only exercise that can be done. You should use wall slide, or if they can, for a certain muscle activation like serratus, obviously, is pretty good. Um, but it's not the end-all, be-all. So that's important to note. Um, as you can read on the bullet points over here on the right, um, a lot of times this exercise using the wall to support their arms is good because some patients, as you know, they can't get up that high um, with their own muscle power. So using the wall to kind of support them can be used earlier in rehab than others when they're having to raise the full weight of their arm. Um, also important for serratus, um, the main focus of this article was to look at over 90 degrees of scapular elevation. These numbers are really small, but this is 100 degrees right here. The same on all of the graphs. So um, as you can see, the serratus is active at a higher level, and that's what a lot of patients have issues with overhead reaching, or that's when they get their pain. I don't get any pain when I'm down here, but I get it up here. Um, so it's more functional to get the activation of the muscles at a higher level than just something you get down here with a push-up with your arms kind of in level here. Okay, so to go into the wall slide specifically, we'll do both because I know we have the forward facing and then the um, back to the wall, wall slides um, and kind of when to use which one and how to position because I see, um, and even I do it with different patients, they don't, they don't know the wall slide as well as we do, so they position themselves differently. And so um, I'm just going to show you the correct starting position, but that doesn't mean that every patient should be in this exact position. And then we'll kind of take the some of the pictures that we saw from earlier and say, if this patient walked in looking like this, how should I position them to do a wall slide? Because not every patient should look the same, dependent on their diagnosis, scapular humeral, either way. So this it's kind of cut off over there. But you can kind of see the guy on the right, or on your left, my right, um, with his feet kind of staggered. A lot of times I forget this one, and it's probably because a lot of patients don't have the issue. But I just had one recently that whenever her feet were kind of in line and pushing in, she was getting so much back pain because she was arching her back to push so hard into the wall. So that's why the legs are kind of staggered to kind of allow you to kind of rock rather than to push with your weight this way. Um, so a lot of people don't do that, including myself a lot of times, um, just because it's easier. It's another step that you have to ask the patient to do, but it will protect their back in the long run. And then I think everyone knows about the about 90 degrees of flexion with a little bit of abduction. The last one is really important. I see a lot of people, um, especially when I'm like, how have you been doing this at home? They throw their whole arms on the wall. Um, and that's going to put them, if they have internal rotation, which is likely why you're doing the wall slide to begin with, um, that's just going to put them into more internal rotation. If they put just their arms, they can kind of get that little bit of scap squeeze to push just with their hand to get the serratus activation rather than their whole arm putting it into internal rotation or, and probably abduction. This picture is a little bit deceiving, but um, putting kind of like your wrist or your pinkies um, against the wall would be the best position. And then the end position. So the bullet points over here are kind of saying where should the scapula be? So it should be for a, someone that has depression, it's going to be very difficult for them to get all the way up to C67. Um, likewise for the other things, the medial border of the scapula being at 60 degrees is kind of hard. You're not going to get your goni out and be like, hmm, this is not quite 60 degrees. But the inferior angle of being in the mid axilla line, so all the way out here, as compared to down this way, is what you're kind of looking for. It's easier to see. Um, 
And then also, you're not going to be able to see the That's tin. why you should just look for excessive anterior tilt. You don't want to be able to see that inferior border popping out when they're sliding up the wall. And then the last bullet point, a lot of people um, are only looking at the slide up the wall, and they're like, what should it look like coming back down? Um, and there's not a lot of good information about what exactly should be happening. Just shouldn't be excessive. Your um, ratio of your scapula and uh, humerus coming down should be almost equal um, rather than the scapula dropping and then the arm comes down slowly. That kind of tells you that you don't have that eccentric control of the muscles dropping the scapula. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So um, using these two positions, we're mostly going to look at the um, starting position. How do we start patients that come in, for example, with interrotation with anterior tilt? So the first couple bullet points you'll see are similar for anyone that has internal rotation. So you want to activate the serratus, like we saw earlier, it's an upward rotator, external rotator, and a posterior tilt. So we want all of those things to be activated by pushing into the wall. A lot of times I see people that are just going up and down, up and down, up and down, and that's not getting the activation that you would get with the serratus anterior. Um, lifting the arms off the wall, I'm pretty sure Michael explained this a little bit, but that's really big for someone that has stiff pec minor pec major. If you get them all the way to the top and then have them lift off and try to hold it, if they're really that stiff, they're not even going to be able to get off the wall. And then that kind of tells you, oh, I need to manually stretch them or I need to give them a pec minor stretch. Um, if the pecs are that stiff that they physically cannot, you can limit their range of motion. So the last thing, the last thing we try to do ever is to limit their range of motion. Um, so we don't want to, if it's painful or if they're not doing it right, just say, oh, don't go that far. That's kind of our last resort. Try to manually help them if they need help. If you need to go in and push them into an external rotation, that's better than you saying, oh, just don't go as far. Okay, so internal rotation with insufficient upward. This lady is the same one from earlier. Um, so this right here is where her um, inferior border is, or inferior angle of her scapula. So the same thing goes, you want to stand close to the wall and activate the serratus by pushing in. Um, the, my favorite cue for this is kind of let your shoulder blades come up and around. And if it's bilateral, it's um, easy. You can kind of just get behind them and physically push them up. They should go, the by it, I mean like the inferior border of the scapula, should go a lot higher than you probably have ever seen anyone. No one that I've seen on the first try can get this like sufficient upward rotation. Um, if it's unilateral, say it's only their right side, getting in from standing on next to them, um, the wall right here, getting in and literally using your whole body to push, the, push um, their scapula up is going to give them the good cue. What you don't want to do is do that for them every time. So you don't want to manually push their scapula up every time because then they'll never learn to use their muscles. So show them this is what it should look like and then have them do it. Letting your shoulder blades come up and around is what I say way too much for these people. Um, internal, rotation, internal rotation with abduction. This is um, tricky in that everyone's like, well, why would you do forward facing the wall? Which is the question I asked Michael at our um, thing a while back because I would have immediately put this person up against the wall um, or back to the wall because of their internal rotation with abduction. It just makes more sense to me. Um, but if they have more issues than just that, facing the wall is also good. And you can, all, you can do both. You can give them facing the wall and back to the wall. Um, that's why this uh, little bullet is down here. If they have the severe abduction, uh, this guy's not too bad, but if he was all the way out, there's no sense in putting him up against the wall to where he'll be even more abducted. Um, the best cue for this, if they are facing the wall, is to raise in a wider V. So some people will try to stay within their shoulders, and that's just going to put them in more abduction. So if you start here and force them to go really wide out here, that's going to put them in external rotation and adduction. Rather than put going here, will they want to come out and around more, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. So whatever they're lacking, you put them into that. And sometimes, like, maybe you don't remember all of the cues that I'm telling you, but if you think, okay, they're internally rotated, how do I get them to externally rotate? Think about, oh, they're going to probably have to squeeze their scapulae together and go in a little bit wider motion, and that will force them in to closer to their spine. And the last one for facing the wall, if they have scapular depression, is to gradually shrug. This kind of makes total sense. Um, you want them to elevate, so have them use their upper trap, elevate their shoulders. Um, it's important that you focus on the after 90 degrees shoulder elevation, so you don't want them elevating right here and then sliding their arms up. So slide their arms up, and then after 90 degrees is where you should get the majority of the shoulder elevation. Likewise, with the depression and upward or insufficient upward rotation, let their shoulder blades come up and around their body rather than just straight this way. Okay, the back to wall slides. I kind of wrote on here that I would indications would be into rotation with abduction. Like I just said, you can do it facing the wall, but I like it. I prefer back to the wall because it gives you the cue of oh, I physically can't go that way because there's a wall, rather than having to think neuromuscularly, this is, this. I'm not, I shouldn't do this. Um, another thing is that these exercises are not just for the scapula. It seems like that would make most sense. But if someone has um, a lumbar spine diagnosis that involves compression, I also like the facing wall or back to wall because it teaches them to go up kind of elongate their spine, and then take a deep breath at the end of their um, shoulder range so that they kind of get that stretching of all of their muscles in their trunk, and then slowly back down so they don't collapse immediately back down. So that's another training uh, exercise for, or another use for the back to the wall. Um, starting position is pretty self-explanatory here. Um, the biggest thing is this last bullet point. I see a lot of people just kind of pinning themselves up against the wall. Um, and especially someone that has humeral anterior glide, putting their elbows behind their shoulders is going to probably cause pain. And it's going to not be good um, for the, the length of their subscap that's already too long. It's going to probably lengthen it even more. So that's why I like putting your elbows kind of in your scapular plane. So 30 degrees in front of the frontal uh, plane here. Um, and then extending the wrists is really just so they can touch the wall. There's no like wrist workout here or anything. Um, it's just so they have the tactile cue of sliding up the wall. Some people can't touch the wall at all, um, which is kind of more difficult. You kind of have to um, think on your feet with that, but um, they don't have to be against the wall. It's not like the facing wall where they're pushing into it. This is just kind of for the positioning. Also really good for anterior tilt people um, to have the tactile cue of pinning themselves back rather than letting themselves fall forward. So why we use back to wall slides? Um, it's basically opposite of why you would use facing the wall slides. You're, strength, you're strengthening these muscles at a nice short length um, and forcing them to scap squeeze and to get back um, Tack, like feel the wall behind them. Um, also a good pec minor stretch. I know a lot of people use the uh, like the corner or the wall stretch. Um, this is just more of a postural teach them, oh yeah, I feel a stretch there. That's how you should be sitting and standing anyways. So then you can use your every day as a, as a pec minor stretch. This is the one that um, can be contraindicated for the back to the wall slides. So if you're back to the wall slide and you do it incorrectly and put them against the wall, it's going to make them worse. It's going to cause them more pain. So again, make sure that you're avoiding pinning the um, forearms against the wall um, and keeping the elbows kind of slightly forward um, so that they're humeral head is in a better position, seated in the glenoid, rather than it being kind of out and able to jut anteriorly if it wanted to. 
And the last slide is a lot of research about why why do we care so much about how much how the scapula moves, um, and all of these incorrect movements can cause many different things, um, like the subacromial space, the impingement. Um, thoracic outlet syndrome, those types of things that we really want to avoid by making sure that they are moving correctly. And um, especially with internal rotation patients, which we see most often, if they are internally rotated, it's going to be very easy for them to be impinged whenever they're moving. Um, so that's why if you manually, manually push them out of the internal rotation and kind of set them back in this position, they may be able to get more range or feel less pain with their impingement um, at higher ranges. That's again why we use the facing the wall slides because they can functionally get a higher, an activation of those muscles at higher ranges. So kind of bringing that all back together. Any questions? I have plenty of time. Anything? Oh, yeah. So the back to the wall, I think we kind of mentioned this um, with Maiko, too. So the back to the wall um, exercise is kind of just like I explained with the knees bent back against the wall, sliding straight up. You can modify that to be a lat stretch by putting um, your arms into more medial rotation and trying to go up with your, I always say, with your leg like, headlights, so your elbows facing directly out. So if your elbows are facing directly out, that's not really an activation of your muscles like it would be here, but it's a really, really good lat stretch. And especially with someone with scapular depression, their lats are going to be nice and stiff. Um, putting them back against the wall, or even supine, same thing, um, having them with their, with their elbow straight forward is going to be a good lat stretch. My favorite lat stretch that I found. A lot of people are like stuck right here. That's pretty obvious why they have scapular pain. Yeah. Oh, with facing wall? Oh. Like facing the walls exercises? Okay. So. Oh. Um. He was asking about like the lowering of uh, when you're facing the wall. So if someone that has scapular depression, they're going to want to um, lower immediately. Um, they're going to, their lats are going to be so stiff and so strong that they're going to pull down um, instead of going down at this um, kind of ratio of the scapula and humerus coming down together. Um, so my favorite cue is to think that there's a string between your elbow and your inferior border of your scapula. So when you're coming back down, it's like a puppet. Those two have to go together. Someone that has depression is going to go like this and then drop their arms. So thinking about that string, elbow to scapula, coming down together. Um, especially someone that has um, internal rotation, if they are coming down at a quick rate and not getting that scapular squeeze, they're dropping all, they're losing everything they just gained. So you got the serratus contraction, you got all of that, and then you just let it fall. They're losing that external rotation strength that they just gained. So don't let them push into the wall really well and then just drop straight down. So push into the wall and also get the serratus activation as you're going back down. Kind of good? Anything else? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So I think the ex the most internal rotation happens after a hundred and twenty degrees. I have that written on here somewhere. Um. There we go. Scapular internally rotates until 125 degrees, and then it starts. So the external rotation motion doesn't really come until after you're so high. Um, 
So when you're restricting, if they have internal rotation and they have a lack of range of motion and it's difficult for them to even get that external rotation, that's when you might have to manually come in. Um, so they only get to, say, 90 degrees and they're like, I have pain. Force them into early external rotation, so before 125 degrees, and see if that allows more room of their um, humerus within their glenoid, if that makes sense. Correct. Yes. So if. Yeah. Well, it's not that you should totally nix the wall slide and say don't do it at all, but it's not going to be as been. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't. If they can't master the wall slide and they can only go up to this far, that's not doing them any good to be against the wall. I think there are other things that you can do, other you know, supine and side lying and stuff like that. Another thing is that you can mimic the wall slide by being side lying and just without the wall, so without the serratus activation, that type of thing, that may be easier than standing. I don't know, um, dependent on the patient case. But I, agree, I wouldn't give a wall slide to someone that definitely can't do it without manual cueing. Most of them can like get like the lat stretch. That's normally something that most people can kind of understand. There's not much cueing to it, um, but I sometimes it takes a lot for them, and sometimes it's the third visit until they can go home with it as a home exercise. Plan. Yeah. Anything else? Nothing.